talk about the decision of the chamber. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, they said that they do not have a, okay, a big game, you know, maybe, I don't know if you were not here. Uh, on April 11, uh, 2011, uh, the French troops arrested Babo you know, after one week of bombings, you know, by the UN and the French helicopters. And then before, you know, they, they started bombing Ivory Coast on April the 4th, uh, the UN and the French, they gave the green light. You know, that's something I, mentioned, I forgot to mention. They gave the green light to Alassane Ouattara's rebels who were holding on to their weapons uh, since 2002 yeah. and who controlled the northern part of the country. And this is how, when they attacked you know, the, the, the army royal to Babo and, and the civilians who were, close, who were supporting supporters of Babo, yeah. this is how they committed those crimes. Uh, the genocide of Duekwe, yeah. more than 1,000 of people were killed at the end of March. Babo falls on April 11. They take him to the ice, they take him to Korogo, in jail over there. Yeah. They take his wife to Otiene, the stronghold of the rebels. Yeah. And then they said, Ocampo, uh, of course, who is more about publicity than doing the real job of, you know, of a prosecutor, uh, said that you know, he gathered you know, enough evidence against Babo. They produced a 4,000 page document. And then the Babo trial started on February 19, the pre trial. February 19 to February 28, and then we were waiting, you know, to you know that they confirmed the charge against Babolora, and then three, two judges out of three, said that the prosecutor gave or pro provided uh, a document, uh, uh, com which which was like a compilation of news organizations reports and then human rights organization reports that. The prosecutor did not uh, give enough evidence and sufficient evidence you know, to confirm the charges against Laurent Babo. So this is what happened that day. And then, of course, they gave more time. Uh, like in the in the real world, in the, in the environment of justice, Babo should have been free that day yeah. or the following day. But they decided to give to the prosecutor six more months, you know, to go and look for more evidence, maybe to come and produce a 10,000-page document. Maybe this time they may have one account you know, so that they can indict Babu. Question on your system? Yeah, um, my name is Najiba. I'm a member of the All African People's Revolutionary Party. And, and I just want us to, I just have a, a comment specifically about the Libyan peace. Um, I, I think that when you're in, when, when your regime or your government is being attacked by quote unquote rebels or, or insurgency, you're going to be perhaps trying to protect your regime, right? Yeah. Um, and so what happens during that time period, and I'm not justifying anybody being, you know, you know, any human rights sort of violations or anybody being killed, you know, unnecessarily, what happens is people tend to die, right? So when you have folks coming from Benghazi saying that they're on the way to Tripoli and you're, you know, there's reports all over social media that they're coming, Gaddafi and his troops and John Perry are gonna have no choice but to try to stop them from coming to take their regime. That's A. I, I find it awfully ironic that when we look at war in the African context, all of a sudden there's human rights violations, all of a sudden regimes don't have the right to defend themselves. Can you imagine if we took 10,000, 5,000, 2,000, 100 people and we say we're coming from New York down to, uh, down to the White House because we're about to uh, uh, you know, have a coup d'etat, what would happen? We wouldn't be able to get outside of Pace University before we would all be dead, right? We'd be floating the river. We would be floating in the river, the Hudson River. We'd be floating up the street. It wouldn't be about a, a human rights violation. It wouldn't be, oh, I can't believe that, that the U.S. did X, Y, and Z. These people are, are, are anti-American, they're anti-democratic, and you know, Obama was elected and all of a sudden, you know, they're trying to, to, to spring a coup d'etat. But in the case of Africa, in the case of Libya, in the case of Ivory Coast, in the case of many different places, whether it's Congo, Ghana, whatever the case may be, it's okay. And folks are not able to protect themselves and protect their people. That's 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 one point I just want us to think about. And then the second the second piece about that is regardless as to what Qaddafi did, good, bad, or different, right? Africans have the right to manage their own affairs. Kwame Nkrumah said it. You do not need NATO, you do not need the French, I don't care where you are to manage your own affairs. You don't see any African nations up in the U.S. trying to manage our affairs in the U.S. and are not necessarily mine, but the U.S. government's. And then finally, when we, I read an article, and I, I'm not making it up, you can Google it, 
right after the, 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 the illegal and horrible killing of Gaddafi on the side of the road like a dog, there was an article, and, and, and I don't know what, what newspaper it was, and the, the, the French, I mean the British, were upset that the French would get more shares of the oil, a French company. Yeah, that was really? So you're really concerned with human rights, but, but now you're concerned about how many shares of the oil you're going to take. So to me, it's like the brother said, it's some funny business here. Um, first of all, in, in, in reference to the oil, I'm glad you brought that up. There was an interesting article, I believe it was in The Guardian, and you know you can research that too. At the initial stages of the war, when uh, uh, Qaddafi's army was still able to hold back, uh, one of the leaders of the uh, insurgents told uh, the, the Guardian, I believe it was the Guardian, that we are going to uh, divvy up the oil uh, concessions in proportion to the amount of assistance that we get yeah. from the, so that article is out there. So that's not even a dispute. Now in terms of the Africa solution, I'm glad you brought that up too. As you recall, Jacob Zuma, South Africa's president, went to Libya twice. And number one, he needed permission from NATO because there was a no-fly zone. So he didn't want to get shot. He's planning to get shot down. He got the permission, you know, this is the president of an African country, needing permission from NATO to go to London, but he did. He just wanted to make sure. So he went there and he got Gaddafi to sign on to the deal, which was a ceasefire, international monitors, a humanitarian corridor for everybody injured on, on, on all sides, and then most importantly, an internationally supervised and monitored election. But who had the most to lose? Who knows who might win an internationally monitored election? NATO did not want to take that chance. So in fact, it was NATO that told the rebels, the insurgents, not to sign on uh, to this deal which uh, al-Qaddafi had agreed to. In fact, the leaders of the insurgency came to uh, an African Union meeting, I think it was in uh, Equatorial Guinea that year, and agreed to sign on to the deal. But they were then told, no, you don't have our permission to sign on to that peace deal. That's why that deal uh, was not signed. They had a better solution, which was to make sure that uh, Qaddafi was eliminated. And then one final point, it was the Sudan actually that played a critical role in uh, intercepting uh, Qaddafi when he was trying to get away from Syria. Okay? And it's believed the, Sudan, the Sudan's army that actually intercepted him and that helped uh, uh, get him uh, captured and eventually killed. And that's possibly one reason why we don't hear anybody now calling on al Bashir to be taken to the International <laughs> Criminal Court. So anybody can strike a deal with the ICC. That's the lesson here. Uh, your question is a very, very, very important question. For for you to see, you know, the difference. I'm going to not talk about just about the trial. Let's talk about the men. Like 20 minutes ago, you have to know the pathways. Now, before you know, so that you can see clearly. Uh, one thing people do not know about Babu, or people do not want, they don't, want, they don't want to know, is that uh, in Africa in the 80s. Uh, there were many leaders who wanted to do the struggle to bring change in Africa through a guerrilla warfare. So many of them embraced the civil war, guerrilla warfare, and you have that in, in Sierra Leone with Fodio Sanko, but my brother Milton, you were in Museveni, and then again, Kagame will come later on, right? So in that context, in that environment, Babu Laurent proposed, and you can double check that, he proposed, what he called in French, la transition pacifique à la démocratie. The translation in English will be a peaceful transition to democracy. But there are many people that are, you know what, Ufo Kwanye has been there for so long, you know, lately, like, what point are they to try to put it up? Babu Laurent refused that. That's one thing that you need to know when you talk about Babu Laurent. Uh, contrary to Babu Laurent, Charles Taylor, when Africa was on the verge of experiencing those like those popular uprising, the wind of the West that came from like this place from the from East European, uh, Eastern European right countries, from Romania, 
with Kausa Shu who was going to you know to build a throne and then that wind was blowing from East Europe you know across the globe and the, the, that wind was going to touch Africa and Nelson Mandela was going to be freed on February 11 1990 right on December the 24th, 1989, Charles Taylor decided to do a civil war in Liberia. So you have to see the contrast between those two individuals. So Ouattara was not maybe uh, a, 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 a leader of, uh, like, how will I say that? He was not uh, on the field in Ouattara himself, but he sponsored, you know, they raised an army. But Taylor was there, and he was a fighter, and he did a civil war for more than a decade in Liberia, and he came to power. So when he became president of Liberia, if you talk to Liberians, they were so tired, because they thought that the only way for them to have peace was to vote for Charles Taylor. And the Liberians had that sense of feeling <laughs> when some of them decided that, you know, hey, let's put Alassane Ouattara there, even though, you know, the UN, had, the UN had to fix the election for him. So that's the major contrast between those two individuals. So Taylor, because usually, this is what people need to know, usually people govern through the means of, through which they come to power. And people forget that. If you take a weapon and, and to kill somebody in the name of change and you become president, you got to kill people and in, in order for you, you know, to affirm your authority. So Taylor did that throughout his term and like as a president, he was killing right and left in Liberia, right? So even to even think that Babolola is at the ICC, I've been up, if you have listened to my interviews, I've been critical of some of the Babo's missteps of positions, but you know, I, you know, in a, how can I say that, in a dream, you cannot even picture the idea of Babo being next to Charlie Law in a prison. You, you see what I'm saying? Babo or not Charlie Law will be in the group of Kagame who sponsored, for instance, the killing, like a, like a shooting down of a, of a plane of a president. Yes, right. Knowing that if the Hutu lose, for instance, uh, the president, they may be upset and go and kill the Tutsi. Right. And 400,000 people killed in, in Rwanda. Uh, you want to know the death toll of people who were killed in Liberia? More than 400,000 people, right? So even if you want to do a macabre, like a, a counting, to talk about people were killed when Babu was defending his regime, like the sister said, you in power, somebody comes and they're taking cities. So what do you do? So you know, my sister, so not to go too far, right? Taylor is a criminal, right? By essence, that's his nature, right? Babolora is a, somebody who believes in freedom, and then uh, so, uh, uh, things can be strange. You in power, people come and attack you, and then to defend yourself, you have to rely on your army, and then you, you are, uh, for, for, how uh, will I say that? And then you found yourself in the middle of something you know you never thought about. You saw the video of the French killing people. So this is what they're doing for ten years trying to overthrow the, the, the guy. So so those two individuals are completely different. And you know you cannot you should not associate you know the histories, you know the pathways and the vision of the world. Yes, sir. <laughs> was already a criminal in Boston, remember? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm so glad. No, no, no. Thank you. Go ahead. Yes, it was, it was a, if you want to know, thank you, my brother. Guess what? The guy was a criminal, a bandit. They put him in jail in America. <laughs> who, has, who, escapes, who can escape from an American jail? So you're an African, and you escape from an American jail, and then you find yourself somewhere like at the borders of your country, and all of a sudden you become a president. Who does that? <laughs> so Charles Taylor was, was uh, tried by the World Court, right? Not the ICC. No, it's a ICC. It's the same thing. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, ma'am? Yeah. Uh, I'd like to explain the difference. Hold on, he's going to explain the difference between World Court and ICC. No, yeah, I mean, Chair Law is not being judged for something that happened in Liberia. It's being judged by what happened in Sierra Leone. Yeah. That's the difference. Mm -hmm. And it was used by people, you know, to make war in Sierra Leone. Because in fact, if they judge you for what happened in Liberia, America, Shirley and all the other people are going to be involved. Right. So that's why many people they explain Laurent Babo was the first head of state to be judged by ICC. Because ICC has been created 10 years ago and they never judge a head of state.
Coach Charles Taylor was not judged by ICC. A special court, right? Yes, yeah, special court on, on, on uh, Sierra Leone. But unfortunately, both fans the same the same and ICC prison. Should I say fortunate or unfortunate to see? I went to visit Laurent Babo and I saw Charles Taylor, who, by the way, converted to Judaism. So that that's the difference between uh, you know the two type of crime, you know for leaders. Two type no, not to, I'm saying you know why uh, the other guy was ICC and Sera and as of today you can see Charles Taylor still defend present like uh, Blaise Compaore because Blaise is covering actually up for Charles Taylor. Okay, so that's uh, one of the differences. The other one is called TPI and the other one is ICC. All right, that was Thank you. My name is Pascal Robert, I'm a Haitian American, I write for the Black Union Reporting for the Huntington Post and a few other places. I want to give salutations to my African brothers from a child of a country that also suffers the brunt of imperialism, colonialism, and all the other issues that we all are playing, playing by. So I, I know the routine, it's just a different manifestation very well. Uh, I'm glad that the title of this forum is The Revival of Pan-Africanism because I was actually going to write a piece about what I consider to be the death of Pan-Africanism in the age of Obama. because. Today we have a culture in the United States where African Americans have a president who is of their complexion and is sending troops to 35 African countries, yes. and yet there is no outcry, there's no concern, there's not even you know a blink of an eye within the African American community that is completely intoxicated with this you know this brown decoy in the White House who was basically acting out mercenary policy in blackface. And I would like us to, you know, to really talk about you know, revival of Pan-Africanism in the neoliberal age where they use brown faces in high places and mercenary spaces to you know, re re up the game in a better way with someone that looks like you. change the script and say this guy who is actually the savior of Rwanda was the one who was possible to of shooting down that plane. Another inconvenient truth. So that could fall in the same category. Virginia, you want to Yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> you know, I think that I, I don't know what happened with the UN report. Uh, I think as always, I mean, you know you used to work for the UN. Uh, oftentimes these reports are the easiest way that they kind of okay, we're gonna write a report, and then you never hear anything about it, maybe at least no one ever talks about it. So it speaks to perhaps maybe the most uh, important thing, Majima and I were talking earlier, we have to write our own history. Uh, and I think maybe everything that we've all said, that's the thing that underscores it, is the reality of the situation is we can only depend really situationally on all of the different uh, uh, media outlets, uh, if at all situationally, 
uh, international organizations. I mean, they all have their own agenda. I mean, you know, Human Rights Watch, which has produced a lot of reports that, you know, detail all these things, they have their own agenda. The UN has their own agenda. They all have their own agenda. And I think it speaks to the issue of Pan-Africanism, which I don't want to get into too much, because obviously the next panel uh, uh, is, take, is taking that on, is the importance of building links one-to-one -one on the ground with people's organizations, not just from above. You know, I, mean, I think that's so much of what it is. And, you know, there's even some African countries that want to develop their own uh, lobby, uh, like when uh, Sani Obache was trying to do that in the mid-90s with Nigeria. Uh, and I think it stresses the importance of us as, as organizers, as Pan-Africanists, as revolutionaries, to really build links between the continent, between the United States and across the diaspora, so that we have that direct one-to-one -one experience, so that we can produce our own reports uh, and, and disseminate the information. Okay. Uh, Okay, I just want to say one other thing. You know, for three years, Columbia University had seminars that were open to the public dealing with the whole question of international justice. I mean, I, I attended them. And, and, and so it's not like, I mean, it just shows you how disjointed things are in New York. But I bring this up and like this, this is in the past. Uh, and also, uh, I was in IFE. Uh, about five years ago, and I brought the whole issue of Africa command to uh, scholars uh, in Nigeria. None of them knew anything about it. They said, what? And I explained it to them. Like, there was, a st and these are intellectuals who were in a state of shock about, like, what? What? You know, like this. So uh, one of the things I think is very important is that there be ongoing conferences that look at in and intelligently bringing in all sorts of people's opinions about what the hell is going on. Because Niger has an Air Force squadron. Now, and I uncovered with other journalists evidence of Special Operations Command in Mali two years ago. There was a crash of a truck in Mali. There were operators from the U.S. Air Force Special Operations Command, and all of a sudden, here it is reported. Now, what the hell were they doing two years ago in Mali? So I'm just saying, here's all these things that have to be sussed out and brought out, and people have to think about this. Quickly, I just want to, uh, you know, my conclusion, my remark would be. You know, to thank my friends, right? Because when the crisis uh, happened in Abigos, uh, when I was given the opportunity to give interviews, and uh, this, I was even watch watching that video last night, and I was called a lone voice, you know, because <laughs> the journalist said, you know, everyone said that this is it for Brian, you still speaking. But at that time, it was so difficult because we have to speak against what Obama was saying, and they unfired to the, you know, the mainstream media and the international community. But, Milton, Eugene, and all those brothers and sisters, you know, came together. They believe that you know one voice can bring a change, and then our whispers today are now audible. And then you know now, as you know, the sun cannot cover. Uh, we cannot cover the sun with one hand. They cannot protect water as our sun anymore. And then don't be surprised, as Africa is a ticking bomb. Don't be surprised. You will hear some tragic news coming from Africa in a few. Thank you very much. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say that uh, in, in, in terms of Brother Naka, um, yeah, you mentioned the debate that we participated in, and we found that later on we had more in common than rather debate. But I don't know if I ever told you, before the debate, two or three people called me and warned me about <laughs> and say his position is completely anti-Africa, uh, he's not a pan-African, so you know, you're forewarned, <laughs> and it turned out to be the opposite. So that just goes to tell you about, you know, be open-minded, and that's the important, so, you know, be safe. Uh, and I agree with you, we need to find a way to coalesce all this information, have a you know, one, uh, one, one spot place uh, where people uh, that need this kind of information that you won't find in the so-called mainstream corporate media uh, uh, can, can come to. And uh, I, I'm really serious when I say one of the future events that we need to look into is to, to put the ICC on trial. And then in terms of, uh, I publish uh, blackstarnews.com, and my email is my first name, Milton, M-I-L-T-O-N, at blackstarnews.com. So I'm sorry I don't have enough business cards for everybody, but I would like to continue this uh, conversation. So feel free to send your information to Milton at blackstarnews.com, and I'll be in touch with you. Thank you. Yeah, no, of course. So, I mean, all I'll say in closing, I think, is just uh, building a little bit on my, my previous remarks. I think that uh, the good thing about everything we've talked about is that these issues are not completely resolved. They're still actually in motion. 
and the fact that the issues are still actually in motion means that we can intervene and perhaps make a difference. And so I would just urge everyone here, well not everyone here because many of you are already involved, but those of you who aren't, and those of you who have reached outside of the African community, outside of the Ivorian community to speak to people, to build with people so we can build coalitions and we can do it on multiple tracks uh, in the general sense against U.S. imperialism and its moves in Africa, and in a particular sense things that are going on in the Ivory Coast. I mean, right now, they've delayed the trial of Bagbo. They say they have absolutely no evidence, and yet they still think that they may hold him. So there's an issue right there to free Laurent Bagbo. I mean, right away, it's the only just thing, the only fair thing for Ivory Coast. We can start a petition. We can hold demonstrations. We can do things against the ICC. We can't just look at these issues as all these powerful forces working up here somewhere, and we're down here, and there's nothing we can do, but that, in fact, we can take everything we talk about here, all the knowledge and all the things, we can come together as political organizations, link up with each other, and wage a struggle and win this battle. Because it's really a battle for the soul of the African people and really the soul of humanity because Africa is the frontline battle against it, uh, that imperialism is waging right now. So if we can defeat them there on the African continent, we can defeat them around the world, and I think that's something that we should take on. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Really. Thank you. And thank you to our extra moderator. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, I think I'm going to finish this now. I'm going to finish this now.